Hey everybody and welcome back to another episode of Field Facts with Forrest. I'm your host Forrest Carpenter and I am really excited to get to talk to you today about what we got going on. On this episode of Field Facts we got a question uh, sent in from Trevor Schmidt. So Trevor if you're listening make sure to uh, send an email and, and get your free hat for this one. Um, Trevor Schmidt basically asked about all things waterfowl photography related. Basically cover it. So that's what we're gonna do. Choosing a camera, figuring out which camera body you'd like, uh, to talking about different sensors, lenses. We're gonna talk about a little bit of post-production stuff uh, and some of the expected conditions and challenges you might run into when taking pictures of ducks and geese, especially in a hunting environment. So uh, let's get started today and let's start with, well, what sounds to be basic, but some of the basic stuff in just choosing a camera. So um, <clears throat> the first and, and foremost thing that's gonna determine what kind of camera you start out with is gonna be your budget. Uh, you know, I, I hate to be one of those guys who's just going to say it depends how much money you have, how much money you can pour into it. Uh, really, the, the more money that you spend, the odds are you're going to get a better camera and uh, especially uh, both lenses and bodies. You, you, ideally, you want to get a really nice body so you can take some really solid shots and good glass is going to get clear pictures for you. So. Um, that being said, you can take some awesome shots and some really great pictures, uh, stuff that you're going to love and you won't even know the difference uh, between until you start spending that money and upgrading your cameras into getting to some of the professional level cameras. Um, so start out, uh, gosh, if you're, if you're able to, getting something like, uh, something like what I've got here with a big full frame or a big crop sensor, but, uh, but uh, like a professional standard series camera. Um, you know, is, is going to be nice, but you're going to spend somewhere between $750 and $3,000 on just the camera body. So um, for those of you guys who don't have that kind of spend and change, I know I'm not one of them and it took me years and years to save up to get what I wanted to. Um, there's other options. So, uh, you know, I started out actually with a little Canon Rebel, just a little kit camera. Uh, it came with uh, an 18 to 55 millimeter lens, little uh, nice lens for landscape basically to cover uh, some wide angle shots and, and to be able to take some, some more comfortable portrait stuff. Uh, and also with a 70 to 300 millimeter, which is what I used for waterfowl for years. Um, you know, it, it wasn't until just a few years back that I really started spending money and upgrading my camera and, and lenses and stuff. So I took a lot of pictures that uh, really helped kind of get me into this uh, photography side of the waterfowl industry. Um, don't be shy. If that's all you can afford, then man, go get it and charge after it and go have fun with it because you can take some amazing pictures. Um, so it really, anywhere on the spectrum, you can find enough of a camera that's going to be able to take good pictures for you. Uh, it just kind of depends what you're trying to do with it. Now. Um, when we talk about different camera companies, Nikon, Canon, Sony, uh, Pentax, you, you name it, there's, there's a bunch of different companies out there that make cameras. Um, there's a couple things you want to consider. Uh, do your homework, spend time sorting out just exactly it is you need your camera to do. Uh, so when I'm taking pictures of birds, I, one of my main focuses is autofocus. I need a camera that's got a great autofocus system that's going to be able to track the bird because while there are some guys out there that are definitely talented enough to stay in focus on a bird uh, that's moving and coming closer and going farther away, I'm not one of them. So I live and die by autofocus. And if my autofocus doesn't work, it's kind of a, a, a rough day. So um, I, in the homework that I've done and the research I've done, I have found that Canon and Nikon have the best autofocus systems uh, for, for taking pictures of a moving subject. Uh, and, and I think most of the professionals out there would probably agree. While there's a lot of guys that get some great shots on Sonys, uh, I, I've seen a lot of guys sell their Sonys to upgrade to Canons or Nikons uh, just because the autofocus is that much better. So do your own homework, figure out just exactly what it is you want to do. Um, but then the other thing you have to sort out is do you want a crop sensor or a full frame camera? So um, in short, to, to kind of wrap up what that is, uh, a crop sensor 
uh, is a different type of sensor than a full frame. So a full frame uh, setup is going to basically take in all the available information. It's going to, whatever light is brought in, reflected, and shown on the sensor, uh, that is what it's going to take. They're bigger files. Uh, they're typically going to be much higher megapixels, and they take forever to write. So uh, you're going to end up with a little bit slower camera, a little bit lower frames per second or FPS uh, rate on that camera. Uh, that being said, there are some nice full frames out there that have some uh, some high FPS uh, capabilities, but they're they're few and far between, and they're very expensive. So the typical trade-off is you're going to get with a full frame camera a uh, slower shutter speed, but a higher quality, crisper image. So for guys who are shooting weddings, uh, and especially guys who like lifestyle type pictures, we'll, we'll keep it you know kind of hunting related here. For the guys who like to take lifestyle pictures of dogs or of stuff going on in the blind, or that real nice close up of a hand loading a shell into a gun, man, uh, the full frame is where it's at. And if that's what really catches your eye and that's what you like to do, get a full frame camera. Um, you're going to be thrilled. You're going to spend a little extra money up front, but it's it's going to be great. Now, um, those full frames are typically a little bit more expensive than crop sensors. So a crop sensor uh, basically will give you about, it kind of varies on the camera, but it's typically 1.6 uh, multiplication on the zoom. So while it takes in 100% of the light, the picture that it's going to take is going to be cropped in a little bit. So that's why they call it a crop sensor. Uh, it takes what's in the middle. And when you're looking through the camera, you see what you're going to take. It's not like you have to compensate for it cropping down, um, but it's going to take a smaller image. Uh, and because it's taking in less of that information, say, you know, 60% of the information, it can write those files faster. Uh, you're going to have a little bit lower megapixels, so the, the images, you may not be able to blow them up really big. You're, you're going to get a little pixelation um, if you try to, to blow an image up too large. But uh, it can take those pictures much, much more quickly. Great things about both of them, the crop sensor is gonna be a little bit less expensive, gonna have a higher uh, frame rate. Uh, full frame is going to be really nice and sharp, take those beautiful, emotional, super crisp images. So uh, kind of a give and take sort of thing. Um, but they're, they're both great. Whatever camera you get, you're gonna be able to utilize it for anything. But if you know that you wanna take pictures of birds specifically or lifestyle stuff specifically, it's a good thing to do your homework on before going out and spending the money. Um, so once we've got the camera, uh, lenses are going to kind of vary as well. So we've got all sorts of different lenses that you can set up with and it, again it depends what you want to take pictures of. I recommend personally that you have a little bit of everything. So um, when I go hunting, I carry uh, three lenses typically, all right? I've got something like this little Tamron 35 millimeter. It is a 1.8, I believe, on the aperture. Uh, and I'll talk about some of this stuff a little bit later on uh, as far as what aperture, shutter speed, or ISO is. But um, this is a 35 millimeter 1.8. Basically, um, it's an off-brand. Tamron is not, you know, Nikon, Canon, uh, that kind of thing, but they do make some really, really nice lenses and they're not nearly as expensive as Nikon. Um, so get something like this that's gonna give you a nice wide angle. It's gonna be great for uh, pile pictures, a lot of stuff in the blind, uh, and, and you can you really get the lens very close to the subject and it'll still be able to focus. So I can take some macro type shots, you know, the close up of the, the majestic blue mallard speculum that uh, has a water drop coming off of it and that, that kind of stuff. So this little lens is great for something like that. Then the next thing I like to have going up, I like to have uh, this right here. This is my Nikon. Uh, this is really my pride and joy, the 70 to 200. Uh, and she is awesome. It's a super nice lens. It's super fast with the autofocus, um, and I can really, really utilize the uh, the high uh, megapixel amount that my body is able to use because this lens is so sharp and so crisp. Uh, it's a great lens. Um, typically, if you find stuff that's made for weddings and super formal events, they're going to be the really, really super sharp lenses out there. So the 70 to 200. 
uh, is known for being one of the best wedding lenses out there because it gives you that wide range. You can be as far out as 70 millimeters, which gives you a nice wide, uh, semi-wide view, not really a landscape type lens, but a, a wider view, uh, or for in our case, maybe say birds landing in decoys, nice and close, uh, but it'll zoom out to 200. So as the birds are working in and, and getting closer and closer, you can still reach out and touch them and get some pretty good bird shots. So once the birds get inside about 30 yards, man, 200 is all you need to reach out and really get a nice portrait of a duck or a goose. Um, and then the other thing about this lens is it's a 2.8. Uh, aperture so a little bit higher um, than this 35 mil but the 35 is able to achieve a 1.8 more easily and doesn't take as much glass to do so the bigger the lens the tougher it is for them to uh, get that aperture super super low uh, and it basically lets in more light so we can take pictures in low light scenarios kind of sounds like waterfowling so uh, this 28 70 to 200 is really my go-to in between lens when I'm out uh, you know, on the dive bomb hunts, we're filming, uh, we're taking pictures of guys working dogs and then birds are coming. I don't have time to change lenses back and forth and back and forth between a, uh, you know, a, a nice wide lens for the, the things that are going on, the lifestyle type shots, and then going back to a big telephoto uh, for all the bird pictures. This is what I live and die by and I absolutely love it. The next lens is the one I've got attached to the camera here and this is a beast. Um, this is an Nikon 200 to 500 and it is a 5.6 so it's got a much higher aperture but it is a super telephoto being able to reach out there and touch those birds with 500 millimeters is absolutely unbelievable uh, I can really reach out there birds a long way away just starting to set up and come in you know especially like your snow geese when they start maple leafing and working their way in from a long way off this is a great lens to do it uh, and also with this being a 500 down to a 200 uh, I really get that the, the last 40 yards of them coming in before the shot so when they're really starting to crank and bank uh, you know, you get your mallards starting to, to really tuck those wings in tight and drop their tails and make those last turns before they drop in over the trees or something. And this lens is awesome. Now, with it being a 5.6 aperture, uh, what I lose is low light ability. So when it's a nice, sunny, bright blue sky day, this is the lens for me. I love it. I use it all the time. But when it gets cloudy or it's early in the morning and it's darker, I'm unable to let the same amount of light in. Uh, so I have to slow my shutter speed way down, which basically creates blurry images. So uh, in short, this is my nice weather uh, bird portrait lens. This is my all around dark light, doesn't matter. Um, it's gonna get the job done uh, lens. So, uh, you know, you, you just kinda gotta think about what it is you need. Now, a lot of these cameras are gonna come, uh, you know, if you buy the kit cameras, you can run into what I had. Uh, and have that you know 70 to 300 and an 18 to 55 those two lenses will cover everything that you possibly need and they're they're a really nice setup to get started with all right uh, next thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about um, basically how to set these up so you've got a bunch of different things to take into consideration but there's three main settings that you can change now uh, you know if you look on the camera here Typically, most of them are going to have a dial like this, and they're going to have different modes, whether it's aperture priority or shutter speed priority uh, or full manual or full automatic. There's a bunch of different ways you can go. And the folks with these camera companies, turns out they know a little bit about cameras. So these automatic settings are pretty darn good for taking some really quality pictures. But you may not be looking for the same thing that those people at the camera companies are. Personally, I don't like using the automatic settings. Sometimes I'll use an aperture priority, but 99% of the time I shoot on full manual, which isn't talking about the focus of the lens and getting a nice crisp image. It's talking about how much light I'm letting into the camera and how fast my shutter speed is. So it, it kind of determines the basic setup for my picture. Now, um, we're gonna talk about three things here, ISO, aperture, or f-stop, uh, kind of the same thing, and shutter speed. So, uh, shutter speed is very basic. It's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, there's shutters on the lens and they flash quickly. They open and close to let in a certain amount of light. Now, um, if they stay open for a long time, 
and you move the camera or uh, things are moving in the background, if, if you've got a, a low shutter speed uh, or a slower shutter speed, those things are gonna be blurred. Uh, and sometimes that's really cool. Like when you're taking a picture of a waterfall or a dog busting out through the water, you can do some really neat stuff. Or even blurred wings on a bird can be kind of artistic. It just kind of depends what you're into. Um, but the faster shutter speeds are going to be something that allow you to freeze the wingtips of a bird. You know, say you've got a mallard backpedaling right in front of you and you can barely see his wings. Might as well be a hummingbird, right? Uh, but if you can get enough light in there to crank your shutter speed up, you can take a picture with a fast enough shutter speed where you can freeze everything. Uh, and, and that's more of my style, like really sharp, crisp bird pictures where nothing is blurry, nothing's out of focus on the subject. The background can be blurred out, that's great. I love that nice bokeh, but um, you're really looking with those faster shutter speeds to freeze an image. That's what they're using, you know, when you've got photographers taking pictures at football games, that sort of thing. So shutter speed is basically how long the shutters are open um, before they uh, close and let in whatever light you're going to record on this image. Now, that works directly with aperture, all right? And your aperture or f-stop determines how much light you're letting in at the back of the camera. Way back here is where your aperture setup is. And it'll either be really little or really big depending how much light you want to let in. Now, there's something else that the aperture does uh, and that determines your depth of field. So say we've got a picture of a dog in a cornfield. Um, if we've got a really low aperture, uh, we've got our, our aperture set really low, say we max it out on this 70 to 200 and we've got it down at 2.8. So something real low like a 2.8 is going to have a very narrow depth of field. So as you're taking a picture of this dog coming through a cornfield, you might only have the, the tip of the snout up to the eyes of the dog in focus and everything in front of it and behind it is gonna be blurry, which creates a really neat shot and a really neat feel. And that blurred background is called bokeh. Now that, that bokeh is going to be um, is something that a lot of people really like and it's, it's highly desired in a lot of aspects because it really brings the focus to the subject. What is this picture about? As long as you nail your focal point it really can create some emotional images, which is awesome. But if you're trying to take a picture, say you've got that same dog, but you're down in New Zealand and he's bringing this back and you've got these monstrous mountains in the background, snow capped, you've got tar and chamois running through the hills and uh, you know, you'd like everything to be in focus. So there's a flock of geese coming behind them and you don't wanna make them blur so much that they disappear. Crank that uh, aperture up um, and the higher your aperture is, say 14 or, 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 or up somewhere up there, get a real high aperture, that's going to be a very, very large depth of field. So not only is the dog and its face and the bird gonna be in a perfect, uh, you know, in perfect focus, but probably everything within about five feet before and behind it are going to be in focus, as well as a lot uh, even further behind it, you're gonna be able to see more. Um, so it'll help keep things in perspective. It all depends on what you're trying to focus on and that's why I like trying to do this stuff manually because if I've got a picture with a pretty boring background I can make it look really interesting by making all that disappear and making it feel like that dog in this instance is the only thing in the world that matters. Uh, or if you're taking pictures of mountains and landscape stuff, sunrises with birds working in the background, you don't want a bunch of stuff to be blurry, especially if you don't have one focal point. If you're taking a picture of a whole scene, you really want to be able to have all that in focus. So crank that aperture up a little bit. Now, the lower your aperture, say back down at 2.8, again, that's letting in a lot of light and it's got that narrow depth of field. So with that uh, amount of light that you're letting in, you can have a faster shutter speed. This is all about balancing shutter speed and aperture along with ISO, which I'll touch on here in just a second. Um, but the shutter speed and the aperture have to kind of match up and there's no way to really calculate this just on paper. There's nothing that says this setting's always gonna work. This combination of settings is gonna give you what you want. You have to kind of feel around for it and you do have uh, some good gauges looking through the camera. They've got great light meters that tell you whether you're overexposing or underexposing depending on how you're telling your camera you want it to let light in. Um, so, um, 
if you've got, let's say, this 2.8 set up uh, in a lower light setting, I can have a faster shutter speed, like one two thousandth of a second, which is pretty good. That's pretty fast, and, and you're going to be able to stop the wings of a duck with about one two thousandth or one thirty two hundredth of a second. Um, and that's really, really nice. Going back to this lens, this big lens here, I can't get down to 2.8. I can only get down to 5.6. So I'm not letting in. I'm letting in a little bit, a um, little bit less than half the light of this, um, this 2.8. So because I can't let in that much light, if I try to shoot with that same 1 hundredth of a second shutter speed, uh, I'm going to get a really underexposed dark image. Now, um, if I am okay with having a slower shutter speed, that's not a big deal. I'll just compensate for it and slow my shutter speed down, balance out my exposure. But uh, say we're taking pictures of ducks. I can't slow that down too much and still get my style of picture with real crisp wing tips where everything's nice and super, super tack sharp. So this is where ISO comes in and your ISO is basically digitally enhanced light. Um, it varies all the way from you know 100 all the way up to 64 million or something ridiculous like that. But basically, it's how much do you want these uh, digital DSLR uh, cameras to enhance the light. Now, the lower your ISO, the less it is enhancing the light. And you're going to get a very clean, very true to what you saw through the camera uh, and through the viewfinder image. When you start to increase your ISO, it it, uh, it distorts it. You see a lot of what we call noise, and you'll see this blue and red and pink, these little dots. It, it just start to look fuzzy when you zoom in, when you really blow up an image. You start to see it's, it's not just like a film camera. It's kind of fuzzy and, and it's noisy. There's a lot going on uh, inside the pixels because you're digitally enhancing light. You're adding light that doesn't, ex or that doesn't exist. So, um, it's okay to a certain degree. There's, uh, you know, typically I like to have my ISO below 1600 at the most. Uh, I can still have a very sharp image that we can blow up real big and it looks great. Uh, but you go much higher than that and you start to really see this fake looking noise. And, and we'll, we'll uh, have some examples of that up here for you. But um, with that ISO, you can enhance the light to make up for a lens that's got a higher aperture like this 5.6 uh, 200 to 500 lens. Uh, so that lets me get away with a lot of things uh, because I can enhance the light. And again, with the waterfowl stuff, we're not usually out on the blue sky, beautiful middle of the day, great light scenarios. We're out there when it's ugly, raining, still dark. So photography for waterfowl is really, really challenging. Um, and, and that's one of the main reasons why. But again, just to kind of sum that up, shutter speed is how quickly that shutter opens and closes and lets in light. The faster the shutter speed, the sharper the image. The slower the shutter speed, the more light you're going to let in, uh, and you can get some neat blur effects. With the aperture, the lower the aperture, the more light you're going to let in the camera, and the narrower your depth of field. The higher the aperture, you're not going to let in a whole lot of light, but you have a very big depth of field, so it's great for those landscape type shots. Uh, and again, the ISO is just digitally enhanced light, so it helps you make light when there isn't shooting light. Your eyes might adjust, but your camera is going to pick up the true light that's out there. So it, the camera won't adjust like your eyes do, and that's what that ISO is for, uh, to help kind of compensate for some of that and take pictures when it's too dark and you don't want to use a flash. You can imagine what would happen to a flock of, you know, say 20 pintails just setting in at first light, and then you get this big flash to go off. It'd be pretty interesting. Um, but anyway, uh, that's how those three main things work. Now that we know how that works, we can kind of start to talk about some of these conditions. Uh, you know, we with the cloudy and dark conditions, it's all about light. So typically, I'm going to have a little bit higher ISO, and I'm going to have the lowest aperture that I can possibly have, and that's going to let in the most light so I can still take a uh, picture with a fast shutter speed. And whether it's dogs splashing through water or ducks finishing in the decoys, um, I really like to take pictures with a fast shutter speed. And, and personally, 
I max out my shutter speed for the available light as often as possible. So when I'm taking pictures of birds, I'm really shooting to be around that one thirty-two thousandth of a or thirty-two hundredth of a second to one four thousandth of a second. Um, that's going to be really nice and sharp, and it's going to freeze frame everything. And that's that's kind of the look that I go for. But everyone has their own taste. Um, when it gets sunny, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, you don't have to have your aperture quite as low. Now you can. Um, run that lower aperture, but now you risk overexposing the shot and letting too much light in. So uh, when that's the case, take your ISO all the way down, decrease that ISO and don't have it enhance any light, any more than it already is because you're getting plenty of light. Uh, and there's plenty of times where with this 2.8, I've got my minimum aperture setting and my maximum shutter speed, and that's almost enough, or it may not be enough in some cases to, um, really stop from overexposing. So sometimes I'll have to either, well, I guess in that case, I, I can only go up with my aperture. So uh, kind of keep those things in, in mind. You're, you're always trying to balance that. Uh, another thing with the conditions that we hunt in is just taking care of your camera. Uh, you know, with a lot of these setups, guys are spending a few thousand dollars for a body and an additional few thousand dollars just for lenses. So I don't know how you guys are on your gear, your decoys, your hunting bags, but I can tell you that everything of mine has dirt in it uh, and it's gotten muddy at some point, gets rained on. I am not nice to my stuff. So getting into photography and spending money on a, on a body and lens was really difficult for me. So I've learned a few things. A, stick it in a waterproof, weatherproof bag, whether it's a Pelican case or a, a dry bag of some sort, come up with something that you can carry your camera in and take care of it. Because as soon as you get dust inside the body and you get dust on the sensor or inside some of the cracks on the lens, uh, it, you're, you're shot. I mean, you're gonna get little specks that show up in all your images. Your autofocus won't work properly. It, it, it just really goes to hell in a handbasket in a hurry. So get something that you can carry and uh, travel with your camera to where it is going to be weatherproof. Second off, when it's out, once you're out in the field or you're out where you're gonna take pictures, uh, especially when changing lenses, keep your all of your lens caps on as long as you can and try to take the best care you can to keep from getting any dust or other debris in there because again, that is going to wreck all your images and then you've gotta go have your camera cleaned and, and it gets to be really, really frustrating. So just easier to take care of it in the first place. Um, and the last thing is be mindful of the weather. You know as well as I do, it doesn't matter where you are, someone's going to tell you, well, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. Well, most places, that's pretty true. So uh, you might be out, everything could be good. You go and, uh, you know, you just shot into a group of ducks and you and your dog decide to go chase a cripper, cripple. Well, while you're on your wild goose chase out here finding, you know, some cripple stuck out in the we uh, weeds, if there's no one around, uh, or, or even if they are, they may not know to put your camera away when it starts raining or snowing. And now all of a sudden you've got a, a less than weatherproof camera that's getting very, very wet uh, that you risk ruining. Um, so just kind of keep that stuff in mind. Always be thinking about your camera. And when you take your camera hunting, things change. Um, you know, you're no longer just out there to go and, and shoot birds. If it, it's great to take along and use uh, while you're hunting, uh, and, and maybe you are just out there to shoot birds and you take your camera just for pile picks and that kind of thing. Uh, but for me, when I'm taking pictures of birds working, my mindset changes from, you know, I can't wait to, to pull up, raise up, and squeeze off on a green head to I can't wait to pull up, zoom in, and squeeze off on a green head. Um, so my attention goes to the camera and goes to these pictures that I'm trying to take. So um, everything becomes about the camera. I no longer um, am focused on killing birds, and it's been great for me personally. I enjoy hunting now uh, even more than I did before because I'm going out and I can take these pictures and I can show them to people and I can share with other people that weren't there just how awesome this moment was. And uh, you know, I've, I've actually convinced a few people to take up waterfowling that really had no interest in it before because of some of these pictures. So it's kind of cool to be able to do something like that. Um, you're, you're setting up your spreads now also for 
photography. So we're thinking about the light. What's the day gonna be? Is it gonna be cloudy and, and kind of uh, an even, dark, overcast light no matter where we are? In that case, it doesn't matter what direction we're looking. Is it gonna be bright and sunny? Uh, and if that's the case, do I wanna be looking into the sun to take backlit pictures? There's some times where that makes for pretty cool photos. Uh, or do I want the sun at my back really lighting up my target uh, and getting these beautiful greens and blues and uh, different colors that the ducks have or, or nice bright orange feet on speckle bellies, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, now you're, you're not just setting up to have the birds finishing in your face, you're actually moving around your setup and you're setting up to get the birds to finish uh, how you want them to in regards to where the, the natural light is coming from. So now you're starting to go from just being a guy who's out there ready to smoke a bunch of birds, pile up a limit, uh, pick out the decoys and get out of there, to becoming more and more intricate with your understanding of waterfowl and being able to manipulate them in such a way that now instead of, I just want the birds to you know kind of get close to me to where I can shoot them, now you're trying to finish them in a certain spot of your spread um, with the right lighting and getting them to face one direction or the other. So it, it's pretty neat and it's taken my waterfowling to another level uh, because now I have learned how to not only finish birds but to manip manipulate them and put them right where I want them for a specific picture. Um, another couple things that we got to take into an account is what is the light doing? Is it, It's not only just sunny, but is there snow on the ground or are we over water? And what is that light doing in regards to that? So if we're taking pictures over dry ground, you really don't have a whole lot fancy going on. Just brown earth doesn't reflect a whole lot of light. That's got a very low albedo. Um, but if you're taking pictures and you just have a fresh snow, blue sky, bright sun day like we get in Colorado all the time, day after a snowstorm, my favorite for going and taking pictures of Canada geese because you've got light not only coming from the sun but also reflecting off the ground and lighting these birds up from the bottom so their bellies are, are no longer in a dark shadow they're they're illuminated and when you get those specks that work in you know occasionally we'll get some specks on the front range in with these groups of lessers man there is nothing better than taking pictures of speckle bellies over fresh snow in the blue sky I absolutely love it you can get some unbelievable stuff uh, and the same thing can be said over water you know if, if you're taking pictures in the afternoon and you've got the sun behind you it's gonna bounce off the ripples on the water and if say you're at a park or at a refuge or someplace and you're taking pictures of ducks uh, you can get some really neat light on birds finishing and, and setting in with other birds so um, just just other things that, that come into play that you don't always think about but that ends up being pretty darn cool um, Something that I would say is be dedicated to getting the shot, but don't risk putting your, uh, your life at risk, obviously. Uh, and depending who you go with, uh, you know, kind of keep in mind what everyone else is wanting to do. They may think it's really cool that you're taking pictures, but they might not be there for the pictures of the birds. They might be trying to pile some up. So keep that in mind and try to be respectful of the guys around you. Um, stay hidden. Uh, you know, it's it's really tough sometimes, say you're hunting out of an A-frame, it's very difficult to get good pictures out of a well-brushed A-frame. So what do we try to do? Either A, we manipulate the brush and go thunk, and really open this thing up, or B, we stand up and we try to get above it. Well, neither one of those things are good for hiding. So for that reason, I say try to stay away from the A-frames, invest in a ghillie suit, or be okay with sitting away from the decoys and away from the action, because then, your friends are gonna be happier if you're not scaring birds. And you're also gonna get some really neat shots and you're gonna be less hindered by the blind setup. Um, some places it works better than others. Obviously, if you're in a 200 acre green wheat field down in Oklahoma or Texas, there's not a whole lot to hide in. So you can't just sit in a ghillie suit just off the side of the blind. It doesn't really work out that well. Um, just just kind of keep some of these things in mind. Uh, another thing, I've seen a lot of great pictures out there of guys taking pictures with the bird, uh, you know, in between the photographer and the hunters who are actually pulled up and shooting in the direction. You get some really cool pictures of, you know, guys uh, pointing their barrel right at you. Well, that's kind of neat, but again, let's take it back to hunter safety. How do you know if a gun's unloaded? How do you know they're not gonna shoot you? It, it can be very, very uncomfortable. So. 
please be careful, uh, use common sense. Just because it would make a neat picture doesn't mean it's a great idea. Um, take care of yourself and don't get too carried away with some of this. Keep in mind, we're still around firearms. There's still deadly force out there and we don't need to go risking something for a picture. Not only that, but can you imagine spending $3,000 on a lens and then your buddy sends a three inch number four at you, you get peppered and look down and now you've got a cracked lens. Um, gets to be expensive in a hurry. So, um, you know, really try to use common sense with all this stuff. I know it's it sounds redundant and I'm, I'm kind of being your, your dad about this, but be careful. Photography is awesome. Nothing is awesome when people get hurt. Um, the last thing I want to talk about today is talking about a little bit of post-production uh, and, and the, the best part about the digital cameras is the post-production. It's very easy with today's technology. Some of the apps like Lightroom and Photoshop, uh, you can do some really amazing things. So you can take some of these pictures and especially shooting manual uh, with manual settings, I get a lot of pictures that are slightly over or underexposed and I have to do some work to them. So not only can you fix the exposure, but you can also brighten the shadows up. You can uh, change a bunch of things to where you can help, again, increase the focus to exactly what you want to. Uh, and, and some of the things that for you guys who are just getting started with the post-production to mess with, I would mess with uh, shadows. So especially if you're taking backlit, backlit pictures, you can brighten up the shadows. So instead of having a black silhouette, you can actually see some detail. You can see someone's face or you can see some detail in a dog's face where he's blowing fog out with some sun behind him, uh, really brightening all that up and, and bring more life to your picture. Um, you can do that. You can darken your highlights. So when you're, again, shooting in a backlit scenario, say you're you're taking a picture or something with some light right behind it, you can darken some of the highlights as well, and that'll kind of neutralize your picture a little bit. Um, anytime that I mess with shadows or highlights, though, I like to increase the contrast, and that just makes my darks, the darkest points, a little bit darker, and the lightest points just a little bit lighter, so there's a little more differentiation. If you uh, increase or brighten your shadows and darken your highlights too much, you're gonna end up with a really flat, kind of neutral looking image, and that's that's never really ideal. Um, so work with those couple things. Uh, saturation, be careful with it, but you can do some neat things with changing the saturation, and if you can select like the green on a mallard's head and make it brighter, that's really cool. Uh, or the speculum on their wing or their feet on a speckle belly or something like that. You can, you can, if you can select those specific things and brighten them up, it can make for a more visually appealing image. But be careful with it. As soon as you oversaturate an image, it's very clear that you've doctored the photo uh, beyond looking natural, and it's easy to kind of go off that cliff. And, and uh, a little goes a long way with the saturation. And the last thing that I'd recommend that you play around with. Uh, is going to be the warmth. So uh, the warmth of an image is basically adjusting the white balance and with one slider on most uh, editing softwares you're going to be able to either make it look uh, a little bit more orange and yellow like it's a sunrise, a little bit warmer, uh, happier day, uh, or you can cool it off and you can make it to where it's more blue and it's more purple and it creates a little bit moodier image say like for a cloudy day you can really cool that image off and it, and it makes it uh, more emotional it makes it feel like you're there and it kind of makes you feel cold when you look at the picture um, so I would mess with those uh, another thing I'm going to say is when you're taking pictures initially, you'll have different formats of images that you can take. So uh, you can shoot in JPEG, RAW, TIFF, there's a bunch of different files that you can make. I recommend, if you're able to, shoot in RAW. They're going to be a lot bigger files and your camera won't be able to save them as quickly. Um, but those images, you're going to be able to adjust and save a lot more. Uh, a JPEG is a very flat image to where when you get something that's overexposed or underexposed, you can't really darken those highlights or brighten those shadows very much. So if you take that picture in RAW, it's gonna save way more data uh, in that overexposed or underexposed area, and you're going to be able to edit your way out of scenarios. Say um, you're taking pictures early on, now all of a sudden this random flock of birds came, first birds you've seen in three hours, the lighting's entirely different, 
and you're duck hunting and they just showed up. So you just pick up your camera, brrr, take a bunch of pictures, you go through and look back and it's all overexposed because you were taking pictures from earlier. If they're in a JPEG format, it might be difficult to edit those back into being usable as opposed to where if you take RAW, it's gonna help you get away with just a little bit more, all right? So uh, just a brief overview. We talked about different kinds of cameras. Again, most of you guys are gonna start with an entry level, something along the lines of a Canon Rebel. They're a great camera. You can get them tuned fairly inexpensively and usually get a kit that's got two different lenses for you to work with. If you decide to spend some more money, say you want to get something like this Nikon D850 big full frame or a D500 that's a professional series um, crop sensor type camera or the equivalents in the Canon lines. I just shoot Nikon because my buddy has had Nikon lenses and they lent them to me, so uh, it, was, it was cost effective. If you've got someone who shoots Canon, that might be the way to go for you. They're both great companies. Sony takes great pictures as well just kind of depends what works best for you. Um, but if you spend a little bit more money on the body, you're gonna be happy, then you're gonna have to go out and buy lenses on top of it. So again, you want something nice and short for some wide angle pictures like this 35 1.8 by Tamron, uh, or, or really ideally something like this 70 to 200. Uh, this is kind of an awesome all around lens uh, by Nikon here. Canon's got something very, very similar to it. Um, and then it's really nice to have a big telephoto. Uh, once you're able to kind of get in the market for it, this 200 to 500 or uh, really there's some awesome 100 to 400s out there, 500 primes and prime just means it's, uh, you, you can't really adjust it. It's a 500 millimeter all the time uh, and, and you're gonna get some really awesome pictures, but those are gonna be, you know, six to $10,000 per lens. So <clears throat> for those of you who don't wanna take out a mortgage, don't even worry about that. But um, those are options, they're out there. You can spend as much money as you want to and you're gonna get what you pay for in the end. So um, choose your camera wisely, do your homework. Don't pick what I say is a great setup. Pick what is right for you and what fits your budget and your mission. Um, we talked about uh, different settings. We talked about shutter speed. Again, the speed at which your shutter opens and closes. Uh, aperture, which is how much light is let in and how narrow or uh, deep your depth of field or depth of focus is. Uh, and ISO, which is digitally enhanced light. So creating light where there wasn't light to be able to allow you to take a picture that's uh, got a little bit faster shutter speed in a low light scenario. Um, and then we talked about the weather. Again, keep that in mind. Please do something to weatherproof your cameras. Don't do what I've done and go wreck a camera by getting it in the mud or hunting in the sand with 30 mile an hour winds and just ruining your setup. Um, think about it before it happens to you the first time. Save yourself a lot of money and hassle. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about just basically setting up for the pictures, how to set up decoys, uh, trying to think about the light and think about your pictures long before you take them. Think about what the sun's gonna do, what the way the wind's blowing, how these birds are gonna work in here and set up accordingly and don't wreck your guys, uh, your, your friends' hunts. Uh, because you're trying to stand up or you gotta move a bunch of camouflage and now this this giant big old black lens is moving around and, and sticking out of the blind. So um, think about all that stuff and of course be safe. And we talked a little bit about post-production, typically in a program like Lightroom is what I would recommend or Photoshop's great as well, but Photoshop's more for um, changing things more dramatically than just some light adjustments like Lightroom is. Um, I hope you guys really liked it. I hope you got some good information out of this one. Uh, I know that I feel like I've been sitting here rambling stuff at you. Uh, so feel free, like always, please send your comments and questions to me directly uh, through my email, forest, F-O-R-R-E-S-T, at divebombindustries.com. Not only just uh, your personal questions and, and thoughts for future episodes, but questions that you have that may not be related to anything like this. If you're wondering what waders you need or, or how you ought to set up in this certain field, you know, I am pretty busy, especially now that hunting season's really getting rolling, but I will do my best to get back to you as soon as I can uh, and help you just as much as I can, however I can, in your waterfowling adventures. Um, please like this video and go down and subscribe. That's what really helps us the most. Um, go and subscribe, turn on your alerts, uh, and, and tell your friends about some of this stuff too. Uh, if there's anything you'd like to see in another upcoming episode, please let us know. And uh, we're getting to the point where we've done a few of these episodes. Please, if you've got suggestions, uh, stuff that you'd like to see, if you want uh, 
you know, we're going to be doing some stuff outside of the hangar as well. But uh, really, any suggestions you've got for this field fact series, please shoot them my way. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, and again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your support. And we'll catch you next time here on Field Facts with Forest.